In this lesson, what we're going to do is move on to the next of our substantive topics for France and Revolution. And we're going to focus on the period from 1789 to 1792. So a relatively short period of time, but a lot of things happen in this period of time. And it's titled The Experiment in Constitutional Monarchy, because this is what really tends to uh, take shape when we see the meeting of the Estates General in May of 1789, because we see the introduction to this attempt to create a constitutional monarchy similar similar to uh, that of uh, some of uh, other states around the world, uh, similar and inspired by the constitution of, for example, the United States, when we start to see the development of that constitution in and around the same time uh, as this one. And this really is the introduction to the French Revolution itself. So this whole period before, we've been talking about sort of the, the build-up, the prelude to the French Revolution, and this is really where we start to see the actual events of the French Revolution take shape. So. In that regard, these few lessons are going to be relatively descriptive in terms of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be just describing the series of events. So in that sense, we're not necessarily doing that much quote unquote history. We're not actually doing any kind of historiography, uh, but we are. It is important that we describe the events that take place in as much detail as humanly possible. So. Like I said, we're going to take an introduction to the start of the French Revolution. So far, we've been exploring the build-up to the revolution under the Ancien Regime, under the reign of Louis XVI. We've been looking at things like the social and economic position of France. We've been looking at the attempts to, first of all, not call the Estates General in May 1789. So all of the attempts with the relationship between Louis and the Paris Parlement, Louis and the Assembly of Nobles, all of Louis' various financial advisors. Uh, to the extent that which they were successful, um, the answer, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen those videos, it, he, they weren't particularly successful. And now we've got to the point where he reluctantly calls the Estates General in May of 1789. We noted in the last lesson as well that France was in a relatively dire situation at this point. As well as this, we noted that there were a number of key mistakes in calling the Estates General and not establishing, for example, an agenda for the meetings, as well as the ways in which voting was going to take place in this period as well. So all of these things are going to start to devolve into the into the um, the shambles that becomes <laughs> the meeting of the Estates General in May of 1789. So. It would begin on the 5th of May of 1789. The meeting will be made up of the three estates. We know already that the first estate is mainly made up of parish priests, the clergy, the, the representatives of the church, who wanted to see higher stipends as well as the ability for them to access higher roles within the church system, as well as having greater control over education. So the one of the problems that we have is that all of these estates, while all representing different areas of French society, also all had different goals with what they wanted to gain from the Estates General. So the first estate, like I said, they wanted higher stipends, they wanted higher roles within the church system, as well as an increase in the control over education. The second estate was made up of the noble families. Now, politically, the majority of the second estate were conservatives. They were relatively conservative. They were relatively linked to the ideals and the uh, principles of monarchy. But there were some liberals within this sort of regime as well. Now, the fact that there was a combination of conservatives, mostly conservatives, but also a minority of liberals, would be problematic since they would be divided internally over taxation reforms. And then they would also be divided with the third estate over also having these taxation reforms as well. So not only were they divided among other estates, but they were also divided internally amongst each other. So the second estate was really just a mixture of all these different kinds of political ideas. And then finally, like I've said, the third estate would be made up of lawyers, landowners, office holders, within, uh, with the notable exclusion of workers and peasants. So while trying to suggest that, which is what the Assembly Nobles did, that the Estates General uh, needed to be called in order for any kind of land tax to be passed or any kind of further taxation policies to be implemented by Louis XVI, the reason for this is the Estates General needs to be the democratic will of the people um, agreeing to the, in, in the issuance of these new taxations. Um, while that is the case, and while it is arguably the case, the Estates General is slightly more representative than the Assembly of Nobles or the Paris Parliament. Um, it wasn't particularly dem democratic in the sense that it didn't have the inclusion of workers and peasants, which made up still made up the majority of French society. 
So, now we've been talking about the Estates General, how did the Estates General turn into what became known as the National Assembly? How did that shift take place? Well, the original aim was to have each of the estates meet separately, but the third estate was under the impression that the group of, uh, would be meeting all together and that this would be necessary for the verification of election credentials. Now, the nobility would vote against this proposal uh, with a vote of 188 to 46, and so too did the clergy with a vote of 133 to 114, so slightly more um, contentious within the first estate, but the second estate overwhelmingly voted against this idea. The third estate then refused to act on uh, until they uh, were being joined by the others, causing a month-long deadlock at the Estates General. And so therefore we go on from the 5th of May, with these particular votes taking place, to the 10th of June of 1789. At this point, the third estate would vote against um, uh, to verify the representatives, but without the other two estates. So we would see another vote taking place. And then a week later, on the 17th of June of uh, 1789, the third estate would vote in a majority of 490 to 90 to call themselves the quote-unquote National Assembly, claiming to represent the French nation and therefore have a right to challenge the king in regard to taxation policies. So we go from the Estates General instantly, uh, immediately at the point at which the Estates General uh, meets, we see a breakdown in the ideals and the wishes of each of the three estates with the nobility and the clergy voting against the wishes of the third estate, the lawyers and the uh, other representatives. And then on the 17th of June of 1789, following a month of deadlock, the third estate would vote to call themselves a National Assembly and claim the right to French representation of the French people. A few days later, on the 19th of June of 1789, the clergy would join the Third Estate in this creation of a National Assembly. And so this brings us to a series of events that take place in terms of the physicality of the French Revolution. We see a move to the tennis court and we see this introduction of the tennis court oath. Because in response to the creation of and the, the labelling of themselves as the National Assembly, Louis ordered something known as a séance royale, uh, which was a meeting of the, by the court of all three of the estates. Essentially, the aim was to delegitimize any action that would be taken by this new quote-unquote National Assembly. And so one of the things that they did uh, was they just closed the room where they had been meeting. They locked the doors. They stopped them from being able to meet in this particular area. The National Assembly was not um, turned off by any of these uh, by any of these actions by uh, by the Séance Royale, and so therefore, in response, they would just move to a nearby tennis court. And it is here where we see the moving, uh, uh, sorry, the the issuance of what is known as the Tennis Court Oath, where they would not dissolve the National Assembly until a French constitution was established. So this is really where we see the motivations for the Estates General and specifically for the National Assembly, which at this point was made up of the almost entirety of the Third Estate and a number of the First Estate, a number of the clergy joining them together into the National Assembly, with the Second Estate, the nobility, still being sat out of this particular adjudication. So, by the 27th of June, uh, so not long after this uh, all takes place, more and more members from the other estates had joined the National Assembly. So the total number of uh, members of this new National Assembly was now totaling uh, 830 people by the 27th of June. It was clear that the momentum was with the National Assembly, which is why subsequently, uh, a few days after the 27th of June, Louis would order the rest of the nobility and the rest of the clergy, the, the, those who were hanging on uh, at the Estates General, to subsequently join the the National Assembly as well. So Louis capitulated to the wishes of the National Assembly and we see the adjudication to the creation of a French constitution. So this is really where we get the title for this substantive topic which is that of the attempts to or the desire to create a constitutional monarchy, the experiment in constitutional monarchy. This would ultimately fail but we do see that the Estates General uh, turns itself essentially into the National Assembly and then we see the oath which is uh, placed uh, very strongly that they would not dissolve the National Assembly until they had established a constitutional monarchy. They had established a French constitution.